Hi everybody, this is Agnes from No Sediment and today let's explore wines I will be adding to my wine cellar this year. If you are not new to my channel, you might already know that I am a passion buyer. I purchase wines for my future self to enjoy. Therefore, in this video, I will not be talking about investment wines that you buy, never see in your life, just to sell off years later. I will be sharing bottles, wine styles, regions or grape varieties that I love on daily basis and have discovered and want to enjoy more. In contrast to my last year's video on wines I was buying in 2023, where I did not mention specific labels, this year I will also be sharing some specific wines. So these are five wines I will be buying more this year for my wine cellar. Ah, the Burgundy. I recall discussions with my wine friends and industry professionals where we talked about certain wines from Puy Fusse in Macon. We agreed that some of these wines would deliver the same quality one would expect from Premier Cru in Côte d'Or. We also discussed that there are certain Premier Cru in Côte d'Or that can provide the quality of Grand Cru. But no matter what each of us thought about each plot, producer or a label, we all believed that these vineyards would maintain their respective statuses and fortunately for us, continue to offer great value for the quality they delivered. However, some things change and as of 2020 vintage, there are 22 Premier Cru classified sites in Puy Fusse, overall constituting almost one quarter of Puy Fusse appellation. And here comes my confession. While theoretically I knew that these wines would increase in price, I did not expect it to be so dramatic. Or maybe I was too busy with tackling the challenges of Covid era and I didn't pay much attention. Now witnessing some Puy Fusse Premier Cru labels creeping way over the $100 mark, I pay much more attention to these wines. I want to stock up on some of my favorite Puy Fusse Premier Cru wines and see where they go and how they develop. Furthermore, I have always liked Macon whites and these wines will make nice addition to my slightly empty wine cellar. Some things never change, I am still in love with Champagne. As I mentioned in my last year's video, I feared that this region and its beautiful wines might follow in the footsteps of Burgundy and become unavailable to everyday wine consumers like me. We already see this happening, not only is Champagne increasingly sold only on allocations, including estate's regular cuvées but it is also accompanied by a price increase. Even one of my all-time favorite prestige cuvées, Comtesse de Champagne by Tetanger, which remained relatively affordable over the years, has now surpassed the $200 mark. And while I believe that diversifying your wine cellar is a good idea, whether for investment or for personal use, Champagne has remained a stronghold in my wine cellar for years. I still appreciate and enjoy larger brand names such as Bollinger, Paul Roger and Louis Reuderer, but I'm also exploring smaller estates, oftentimes family-owned grower champagnes, such as Don Grillet, L'Armagnet Bernier, Apollonis and Vilmar. Similarly, as I mentioned last year, I still believe that vintage champagne is where the real value lies. I have been pleasantly surprised by the 2013 vintage, which is shaping up quite beautifully. On the other hand, while I don't think there will be many vintage champagnes made from the challenging 2017, I might be careful with those and only follow the top best producers who have always quality in mind. While I have always appreciated Syrah grape, especially the examples coming from Northern Rhone, it has never been wine I've been choosing or buying intensely. However, with my trip to Rhone last year, as well as tasting some truly exceptional examples from Cornas, Saint Joseph and Hermitage itself, I have fallen in love with the region and its wines. Although this area has been under the radar of wine collectors and investors for a while now, 
it still offers great value for the quality it delivers. Furthermore, these wines can age, and age magnificently. The only issue here is that Syrah can be quite pleasant in its young age as well, which is why not many examples live to deliver that earthy and leathery complexity mixed within ripe red and blue fruits. Therefore, I will be buying both fresher and fruit-driven Creuse Hermitage and Saint Joseph for early consumption, as well as those more expensive labels to forget in the cellar for years, such as Cote Rotie, Cornas, and Hermitage. Northern Rhone has its fair share of large companies that can deliver the expected quality, but I will also be experimenting this year and searching for smaller estates. As I mentioned in the video about my 2023 highlights, diversity in the wine world is where the excitement lies for me. I want to see stems, partial stems, no stems, no oak, old oak, some new oak, co-fermentation with white grapes, short cellaring, long cellaring, you name it. And for that, I believe Northern Rhone is a place to be. And once again, I am late to the party. And naturally, there is no need to talk about the famous Lopez de Heredia whites. These are ultra rare and can become quite expensive in the secondary market. Quite frankly, for a while, they were amongst very few wineries that made white Rioja worth seeking out. The other one being Marques de Murieta. However, that has changed for better now and more and more producers are starting to make truly exceptional white wines in the Rioja region. The principal grape variety in Rioja Blanco is Viura and it can be a sole player in these wines. However, it is allowed to add Garnacha Blanca Tempranillo Blanco, and even some international grape varieties. Surprisingly, these wines deliver great freshness, acidity, and fruit-wise. Many great examples will have seen oak, and yet the flavors of preserved lemons, orange blossom, spring meadow shine through. I think it will remain a niche product in terms of production. However, I believe whites of Rioja could become more expensive than their red counterparts aging just as long and delivering the same complexity, if not more. This is the wine I have been happy to see in my wine cellar and certainly will increase the number of bottles this year. As I mentioned in my previous video, this wine, specifically the 2015 Stella di Campalto Brunello di Montalcino, was my number one best wine experience in 2023, and I want to have it more in my wine fridge. Like other wines on this list, Brunello di Montalcino has experienced an impressive increase in sales, accompanied by a steady increase in price over the last couple of years. While I do think that not all Brunellos are worth the price, there are some that are just irresistible, and Stella di Campalto is amongst those. Stella's wines are layered and complex. She makes her wines from a single vintage and still manages to retain freshness, elegance, and an impressive depth of flavors. Furthermore, she works in harmony with her land and soil, and that translates into the wines. While Stella's wines may not yet be as loud and famous as Biondi Santi, Soldera or Poggio di Sotto, she will certainly be there. And I want to make sure that I have enough of her wines in my wine fridge to enjoy them while the rest of the world trades them. So here you go, five wines I will be stocking up with in my wine cellar this year. Whether you are buying wines for investment or your personal enjoyment, make sure to watch this video on six essential tips for building your perfect wine collection.